right. All right. Uh, he's a little different today. Um, Josh is home, uh, not feeling good. His back hurting. So we have Will and Kayla. So it's gonna be a little different this morning. Uh, but I'm gonna pray for us and uh, we'll dive right into worship. Let's dive. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for. Uh, the ability to gather and the last minute thing that Lord, um, I pray that we glorify you. This will, this whole service, everything in this, Lord, that um, you would challenge us and convict us. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit will be in this place um, and do a work in all of our lives. Uh, I pray as we uh, worship you through these songs, that it will glorify you, it will bring um, a smile to your face. And uh, it, it would please you. And so uh, just put our hearts in the right place, set our minds in the right place to worship you in this moment. Uh, and thank you for all you're doing in all of our lives and uh, do a work today. We love you. Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's start worship. Good morning, everybody. My name's Will, and I am the third string guitarist, so I apologize. Um, no, we we picked a few songs that um, are both meaningful and uh, we believe that I could pull off. Um, you know, I I heard someone say once when uh, they heard someone singing who didn't necessarily have the most beautiful voice in the world, you know, God honors it all, and that's what I had to keep uh, reminding myself of. When, when I'm seen or when I'm up here and I mess up, which is often, you know, is that God honors a humble offering, an offering that is given out of love to him. And uh, so that's what I believe we're lifting up this morning. It may not be the most perfect worship, may not be the most perfect offering, but um, we will say it's at least a humble offering of love to him. Um, so, please join us, and uh, if you can, ignore my mistakes. <laughs> I'm also running off my phone, so... <laughs> Fix your eyes on this one true 
God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Oh, 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 Swing wide, no overzealous there. Swing wide, all you heavens, let the grace go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, we lift your hearts, good grace, good God. All you heavens, let the grace go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, he lands good hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, we lift good hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Luckily, God shows lots of grace for us. <laughs> you know, uh, you guys sound great, you know, and I believe at least God is hearing a joyful noise coming from me. So, <laughs> Do you like that, Greg? <laughs> no longer slaves. All right, the next one is no longer slaves, which I at times replace with. Um, it's supposed to be no longer a slave to fear, and I mess up and say no longer a slave to sin, but that is also true, so you can say whatever you want, um, and I won't judge. <laughs> You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. From my mother's womb. Oh, I am a child of 
season's done. So we're going to take down the rest of the stuff. Some stuff's already been taken down, but we take down the rest. You can stay after. Uh, if you can't, no worries. But if you can, we're going to pick some stuff up really quick after service. So it'll be great. Uh, another thing we need is the next couple weeks, we're going to be buying a van. I mentioned this last week. I'll mention it this week as well. A couple people have stepped up and said they'll, they'll drive the van, but we could always use more. Like I said, it'd be nice to have uh, more people drive this van. This would be kind of the next ministry we're going to start providing for our community to provide rides, to come to church here. Uh, we already pick up people every single week, and it's quite a bit for one person to do. Uh, and Sean's done a lot of driving today, so back and forth, back and forth. It would be great uh, just to be able to do one. And plus, we want to really provide this ministry to our community to get people to come here. Uh, one last thing is a Growing Together class, January 17th, happened right after this service. Uh, what this class is, it's basically it's, it's a new member class, but it's also a class just to kind of uh, learn a little bit about our church, uh, the vision, the mission, uh, who we are, uh, what we feel God has called us to do here at Living Water. So if you've never done that, if you are new, um, I would encourage you to go to that January 17th right after the service. Um, if you are going, let us know on your next steps card right in front of you so we can know expect you to be there. Um, all right, so let's pray again. Uh, we pray for, particularly for our congregation, and we'll dive into God's Word. So right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the uh, ability to gather this morning. Thank you that we could be uh, in this place and worship you, and um, sometimes things don't go as we always plan, Lord, but I, I do believe um, you, nothing is outside of your purpose. Um, Nothing, nothing outside of your plans. So while um, we plan things, you have different plans, Lord. We've seen this in 2020, and we're praying for the next coming year that you will plan in uh, the right steps and the right places, God, for us to step into. Um, and as we get into this new series we're starting this week, really put it on our heart, humble us, help us to see where we are falling short, uh, where we need to change, and where... Um, you might need, through your Holy Spirit, to mold us and shape us in um, whichever way. Uh, God, I also pray um, just for our congregation, some different things going on. Rhonda with her cancer, I continue praying that you would uh, heal her, God, of her cancer, but also just give her comfort and peace and entire family. Uh, let's think of the Davis family as well, dealing with uh, Kirk's brother. Um, his cancer, we pray for Bob uh, and his recovery from the surgery and, and um, his healing all together in his life, and uh, I also want to pray uh, for Chris Holcomb, uh, he's in the military, he's away, uh, I just want to pray for protection of him and uh, protection of Sarah as well in this time, and uh, for our congregation as a whole, for people that are quarantined right now that aren't here with us, uh, mental health uh, is always an issue at this time of year, uh, marriages that uh, struggling, um, just everything going on, Lord, I pray that you would um, be in it all, and you would protect us and keep us safe uh, through this. And Lord, I pray that we would glorify you in the coming days. I pray that we would uh, see revival, uh, we would see people being, uh, disciples being made in this place, and um, in other churches as well. Lord, I pray, continue praying for churches around us that are on the same mission as us, uh, glorifying you. And God, may we see Waterville transformed by you. God, so we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, like I said, we're starting a new series this year. Uh, every single uh, new year, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like, it's like you know, it's a change of a couple days. <laughs> like, everybody thinks 2020 is over, but it's literally just a few days difference. But something happens, I think, in every single one of our minds when you switch the year. Like, you have a mind shift, uh, a mind shift, right? If something happens that you, even though it's only a few days different, but because it's a new year, we got a whole new set of seasons, and our mind kind of shifts to think differently. This is why many times in the new year you, we make resolutions. We make uh Things in our life we're going to try to improve. Uh, sometimes uh, we, you know, whether it's working out more or eating better, or sometimes it's uh, it might be you thinking more positively, or uh, sometimes it's, it's even things like you know, like many times as Christians we start like new Bible plans, where it's like I'm going to read through the Bible in a year, and usually by the time you hit like February or March and you get to 
like Exodus or Leviticus, and you're like, done. Right? That's always kind of how it works. But, but we all try to do this. We always have like a vision for the, for the new year. And sometimes our vision for the new year, as we saw last year, God throws a curveball at us. I mean, 2020 is a perfect example of this, where uh, we, we had all these plans for the year, and then all of a sudden, God says, no, this is, this is the direction you're going to go. And sometimes it's for the better. As we looked at last week, uh, we looked at kind of some, uh, a recap of what God did in 2020, and we have a baptism today of Diaz that is like a, a reflection of what God has done last year through uh, the food card and the food ministry we did, and just all that God did because of this curveball, the coronavirus that got through at us, but it got, got the glory through this, and he, we did the best we could with it. So starting this new year, what I want us to do, we're starting a new series, but I want us to focus on, on vision. I want us to focus on thinking of what, what uh, God wants for the church, our church, but even the church as a whole. Uh, last, last year we did, we, st- we started to focus to find our DNA, and I mentioned this last week of just why to think through why has God kept us here? Why has God kept this church around? Um, what is the purpose for this church? I mean, he has removed many churches in the past that were not making disciples, that were not glorifying him, and God has just ended those churches. And, and at the same time, there is many churches around us uh, that, are, that are bigger and sometimes even smaller. But why has God <coughs> kept us here? And, and even past that, why has God brought you here? Like, why has God brought you to this church, and how, how has God uniquely gifted you to be a part of this family? Now, as we look at last year, and this, this series is very similar to, to last year, our focus, but it's different in some ways. But the foundation of our DNA, as we found last year, looking into God's Word, was to make disciples. That's what the foundation of what we need to be as a church, is a church that makes disciples, not a, a social club. That's just all about us, and we never think about anybody outside, and many churches you experience this, and you come in, and uh, it's almost like you can't be a part of that church, because they're already so interconnected. But we also don't want to be a concert. We don't want to be the other side of it, but there is no uh, connection with with each other. There is no family aspect, where it's all just about the show, and and there's nothing, you know, in depth there, right? So we, we we don't want to be either one of those. We want to become somewhere right in, in the middle of all this. We, but the core of what we want to be as a church, we want to be a family that makes disciples. That's a tagline we put on a lot of our things. We want to be a family that makes disciples. So this year, what I want us to do is kind of refocus and, and get back to the question that I want to put in our minds. is what did Jesus, Jesus envision for the church? Like when, when Jesus send it into heaven, what did he envision for the church to be? So this series we're going to look at is a little bit differently than what we normally do here um, as, as a church. We're not going to work through a book in the Bible. Uh, we will get back to this right after the series, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to look at a topic, a topic that is very rooted in Scripture, and a topic that I really believe needs to be the focus for 2021 and, honestly, the years forward. And you probably, this power comes up, yes, yeah, so you can see the topic there. But I want to start with a question, and, and to get that, that question coming back to our minds, is what did Jesus envision for the church? If you had to sum up, think about this, if you had to sum up what Jesus, Jesus envisioned for the church in just a few words, or uh, not a, a long run-on run on sentence or a paragraph, but just a couple of words, what would those words be? Like, get your minds thinking this way. What would you sum up in just a couple words how Jesus envisioned the church? And, and, and think about this. Coming off the a series we, just, we were just on in, in John chapter 13 to John 17, where we looked at the last words that Jesus told his disciples before uh, his death on the cross, before the resurrection. Let's think about for a minute, what were the last words Jesus told his disciples before? disciples before he ascended into heaven. Like, I mean, th- those words have weight. Like, before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples uh, some certain things. And I think if we look at these words, we can start to see what Jesus envisioned for the church. So I want to look at this, uh, this the, looking at uh, each one of the gospel writers, how they ended each one of their, their accounts of Christ, and even the book of Acts. 
and look at the final words that they decided to write down what Jesus really told his disciples to do. So look at this verse, uh, verses will all be on the screen. Um, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I'm going to go through this pretty rapidly. So then you have the book of John. John 21, verse 15. Jesus is uh, talking with, with his disciples, and he particularly hones in on Peter. And listen to what Jesus says to Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And you look at the fish. Okay, they're eating breakfast, they're eating fish. I don't know we have breakfast. Uh, but they're eating fish. And Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lamb. And this goes through a process three times. Jesus says the same thing to Peter. Do you love me? Peter said, yes. And Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And Jesus ends the discussion with Peter in verse 19 and then in verse 22, the same line, follow me. Then you got Luke 24, verse 47. And Jesus says, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name, in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Mark 16, verse 15, very similar. He said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And then the most famous one, Matthew 20, verse 18 to 20, the Great Commission, Jesus says this to his disciples. And Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, you look at all five of these accounts, you start to see something very in common in what Jesus called them to do. And I put this up on the screen so we can see this, and it's, it's, it's a very, all these have a very similar tone to them. It's a call to do something. You look at the book of Acts, Jesus calls them to witness. The book of John, Jesus calls his disciples to feed. Luke and Mark, very similar, but this idea is go to proclaim. And then Matthew, you find Jesus saying, make disciples. <coughs> What you can see very clearly is that there was an idea for his disciples to go, to do something. That there was never this idea that, that Jesus expected his church to uh, sit around and drink coffee and tea and hang out. Or on the other side of it, he didn't expect his church to just be pumped up with all kinds of biblical knowledge, yet do nothing with it. He never envisioned his church to be this way. Instead, he envisioned his church to be on mission, to do something. And the mission is so clear. He envisioned his church to build a kingdom. It's all, if you look throughout all the gospels, Jesus continued to say to his disciples, I've come to build a kingdom. He talks a lot about the kingdom of God. Even John the Baptist said, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' goal in his, in his mission was to build a kingdom. And then he told his disciples, You are going to do the same thing. This is how it's going to happen. How? You are going to witness, you're going to feed my sheep, you're, you're going to proclaim the gospel, and you're going to make disciples. There's a clear understanding you are going to do something. Now, the question we all have in our mind is, well, how is this going to be done? Okay, we get, that's, that's, what it's going to, that's what Jesus had in mind, there's going to be a mission, but how is this going to be done? I mean, Jesus must have had something in mind of how the church was going to make disciples, how the church was going to build the kingdom here on earth. How is this going to happen? If you follow the disciples in the book of Acts, especially in Acts chapter 2, where the church started, uh, you've got the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people come to know Christ, they were baptized, and after this, Acts 2, 42 to 47, you find the beginning of the church. And the idea of making disciples, it almost seemed like it was so ingrained in them. It's almost like it was natural to them. Like it wasn't something they had to talk about, or uh, they didn't have to preach entire sermons on uh, a cult, uh, a, a, a discipleship. It's just what they did, it seems like. It's just how they lived their life. You could even say that I would, I would even say that you could, defi you could say it defined the church. It was a place that made disciples that would be sent out to make disciples. It was a part of their church's culture. A culture that if you look at throughout the gospel, you see Jesus in, ingraining this in the 11 disciples that started the church. And that, 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 
that culture would be carried on to the thousands that would come after the disciples that would make up the first church. And I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus' vision for the church would be a church that had a culture of discipleship. A culture of discipleship. And this is our vision for 2021. To see Living Water become a church that has a culture that Jesus wanted for the church. Wanted this culture. A culture of discipleship. In the next few weeks, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to explore what this culture looks like. We're not going to get through it all of it into this this week. I'm not going to try to pack it all into this week. So I want to take some time to really look at some practical ways of what this looks like um, in this church. And how we can see a, this culture in living water. So like any series, when we look into God's Word, what I would ask is as we go into the next couple weeks, um, is for us all to honestly and humbly evaluate our lives in the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. To not just let this go by, to not just say, well, that's for someone else to do, to honestly look at ourselves and say, okay, where, where are we falling short? Like when we talk about this culture of discipleship, um, it's not going to be done with just one person. It's not going to be done with just the pastor or a couple key leaders. It's every single one of us saying, Okay, I get it. I get it. We are called to make disciples. And, and when we go through these next couple of weeks of what this looks like, we must honestly evaluate our life and look inside and say, okay, it's like we talked in the last series. Where does the Holy Spirit need to prune us, need to mold us, need to make us into more of a follower of Christ to be a disciple and to make a disciple? We're going to make, make disciples. Now, follow what this means, though. I want to look at this, this, this phrase for a minute, a culture of discipleship. Because discipleship is something you find all throughout Scripture, but the words put together you don't find. You don't find Jesus talking about a culture of discipleship. Uh, you don't find this phrase anywhere throughout Scripture. It's not a phrase that I come up, came up with either. Um, it's, I don't know who came up with it, but it's, it's been mentioned many, many times. But if you think about it, it, it makes sense. Because a culture is the way you do life. That's a simple definition of it. It's the way you do life. And every single person in this room, we're all part of a culture. Sometimes you don't even know you're part of a culture. Like, for instance, in in Maine, uh, there is definitely a culture here. So much so that uh, if you weren't born in Maine, we say, well, you're not true Maine, right? (laughs) You don't don't understand how we do things. You do things a little differently. You're not not a Mainer, whatever that necessarily is. Now, here's what's interesting and something to ponder. How do you know you're part of a culture? Like, if you were just stuck in Maine forever, never left this bubble, you wouldn't even know there was any different cultures. You just the way you did life. You just do it this way. Everyone talks this way. Everyone says things this way. Uh, people, people eat this way. Like, it's just the way everyone does things. You would never know there's anything different. The only way you know you're part of a culture is to leave your culture and to see how someone else lives, right? And many times... We experience this, and many of us have experienced this, and you call this culture shock. When you enter into a culture and it, there's something so radically different about that culture that it causes an awe, an amazement, of like even a shock in you. Like you might experience this if some of you have ever visited a third world country. You see this immediately. There's something, the way they do life, or even just a, another country in general, and even different parts of the United States. You find they do things so differently and causes a shock. Now follow me on this. Jesus tells his disciples, we, we just got off a series looking at the book of John. In John 17, verse 16, he tells his disciples, he prays for his disciples anyways, he says, we are not of the world. The disciples are not of the world. Just as Jesus is not of the world. Right? And earlier in, in the book of John, John 15, 19, Jesus says that he ch- chose us out of the world. So, think about this. We are not of the world, meaning we have a different way of life, right? We don't do things the same way the world does things. Or at least we, we, you could say we have a different culture than the world, right? And what is that culture? Like we are are meant to be different than the world, we are meant to be out of the world, so what is, what is it that makes us different than the world? And how would you define that culture? How would you find that different way of life that's not like the world? I would boldly say um, uh, and say that that culture would be a culture of discipleship. 
And why am I so positive in saying that? Is because when you look at Jesus' ministry, his first uh, three years, well, his last three years of public ministry, when he started this, how did he start his public ministry? Think about this. What did he do? He found 12 guys. He found 12 guys to be his disciples. And then he poured into these guys. He did life with these guys. And yes, there were definitely crowds following him. I mean, all the time he had crowds around him. And there was probably even more than these 12 guys that were following him at times. But these 12 guys had a special relationship with Jesus. And you even find in Mark chapter 13 when he calls these, uh, sorry, chapter 3, uh, verse 13. When he calls these guys, the, he calls them out of crowd. There's a big crowd of, of people around Jesus listening to him. And then Mark writes in Mark 3, verse 13, and he went up on the mountain. Jesus goes up on the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. So, crowd around him, and Jesus looks at these twelve guys, and he calls them. Those whom he desired. Those whom he said, you are going to follow me. And when you look at the, the, the whole entire gospel, what you see is Jesus pouring into these 12 guys. Doing life with them. And even if you look past uh, these 12 guys, Jesus had a, a more deeper relationship with three of them. Peter, James, and John. There's a deeper core that Jesus even said he revealed even more truths to these guys. So throughout Jesus' ministry, if you think about this, Yes, there were miracles. Yes, there was great teachings. Yes, there was all kinds of things that Jesus was doing. But most of Jesus' ministry was spent with these 12 guys. It was spent with these 12 guys. And they, were, they did life together. They loved each other. There was a deep bond between them. Probably even deeper than their own family, this bond was so tight. Jesus taught them deep truths. He, we looked at the past few months, looking at the book of John, we looked at some of these deep truths that Jesus taught them. And Jesus created in them a culture, a culture of discipleship, a culture that he called his disciples to replicate in the church. So where I want to start, and where I want to bring us right now as we kind of get into the Foundation. I want to start here. The foundation of what it means to make disciples. And I think a place we need to start is just even just to look at some of these phrases. I mean, you, hear, you hear it all the time, disciple, discipleship, discipling, and all this stuff. But what does it actually even mean? So to start here, what is a disciple? What is a disciple? You hear it all the time. You hear 12 disciples. So what is a disciple? A disciple can be defined in Matthew 16, verse 24. But Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, the disciple of Jesus follows Jesus. They deny themselves, they take up a cross, take up a form of torture, but they deny everything in the world and they, and they start to live a different life. So, a disciple is a follower. A disciple is a follower. So this means simply, if you think about this, every Christian is a disciple, right? Every single one of us, if you call yourself a Christian, you are a disciple. Even the name, even the word Christian, what it means is a follower of Christ, okay? So it, very simply, to be a Christian means you are a disciple of Jesus. So then, what is discipleship, right? A culture of discipleship, but what, is the, what does this word discipleship even mean? Well, to label it very quickly, discipleship is the act of following. So pretty simple, if you think about this, it's the action to the label. Okay, so, so if you are a disciple, meaning you're following, it means that you are following someone. You're being discipled by someone. You're going through a process of discipleship. And uh, in, in the thing about in the world, like we kind of take this phrase, but you can be a disciple of somebody else. Like there's disciples of Gandhi, there's disciples of, uh, I, don't know, I mean, many, many people, many, many teachers. And when they start following that person, they are being discipled by that person. They're going through a process of discipleship underneath that person. So this is, what this means is, is every single Christian, you are a disciple, every single Christian is also going through the process of discipleship. 
So what this means very clearly here is being a Christian is more than just checking a box in a survey form. Being a Christian is more than just following or believing a statement of faith. Being a Christian is more than just attending a church. It's more than just being a member of a church or being a good person. It's far more and deeper than just that. Jesus would actually, I think Jesus would define discipleship like this. John 15, 4, looking at the, the analogy of the vine. I love going back to this because we just looked at this for the past few months here. But Jesus says in John 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in the vine. So going through discipleship means you're abiding with Christ. You're following him. You're living with him. And part of that means you're going to bear fruit. So when you follow Christ, when you are going through discipleship, the Holy Spirit's going to change you. He's going to mold you. He's going to make fruit come off you. He's going to make you look more like Christ. This is part of what discipleship is. And every single one of us as Christians are going through this always. Never stop it. Until you see Christ face to face, you are going through a process of discipleship. And the last word I want to define, I, I would just say, I, I would probably say is the least common or at least the most overlooked. We all understand being a disciple. We all understand being discipled, going through discipleship. But then, what is discipling? What is discipling? Discipling is this. It's helping others follow Jesus. Helping others follow Jesus. So follow this, okay? Becoming a disciple of Jesus means we start to follow. Jesus in us, through this, we start a, a new life. We deny the world. We take up our cross. And when we start to follow Jesus, we start going through discipleship. But Christ also clearly understood that eventually, as we're going through discipleship, we would disciple others. It would almost be natural to us. Like it would just be something we just do. In a way, I think I can boldly say, say that it, it's part of what it means to be a Christian. I mean, you just look back at Jesus' last words to his disciples. I mean, this, this idea of making disciples is so clear. He says in, in Acts, he says, to witness in John, to feed, Luke and Mark proclaim, and Matthew make disciples. Like, it's all very clear what Jesus told his disciples to do. Witness, feed, proclaim, make disciples. So clear you are going to do stuff. You are going to make disciples. Now, I know what you were, some of you were thinking. Well, of course, that's, Jesus said, said it to the apostles. He said this to, to the 12 guys that were following him, that, that saw the resurrected Christ, that saw him literally float into heaven. I mean, yeah, that, those guys, of course they can do it. The ones that are gifted in it. And, and you think in today's terms, many of us can think, well, that's, that's the call for the pastors. That's the call for the, for the elders, for the leaders in the church. That's their call to witness, proclaim, and feed, and, and make disciples. Or even use the word, that's the priest's job. And this is a common thought in the church, and it's so, so wrong. You look at 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. This is what Peter says to the church. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, and you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you look in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. He says it again. To you are to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's ironic is, is Peter is writing this. And, and what's ironic is, is that many of, us, many of us as churches, even though we would say we don't do this, but we, we, we kind of think of the church in a Catholic model. What I mean is you expect the pastor or priest to do all the work. We expect, we expect the, the guy up front, or like I said, maybe it's a couple of the key leaders, they're the ones that are going to make disciples. They're the ones that are to, to feed the sheep. They're the ones that are to do all that stuff. And, and part of that, yes. I, part, I, totally, I mean, obviously that's true. But it seems like when Peter's writing this, he rejects that idea. It seems like when Peter's writing this, he's calling every single Christian, every single follower of Christ, a priest. Now, obviously, he has gifted certain people to have more of a public preaching ministry. 
or public teaching ministry, or even evangelism, and other things. He's gifted people in different ways. And in this series, I want to look at this a little bit. It's, it's the gifting that God's given you. But Peter's saying the church is a royal priesthood. The church is full of priests that are to proclaim his excellency. That are to proclaim the gospel, that are to witness, that are to feed, that are to make disciples. Now, this, I believe, is where we struggle. We're all called to make disciples. I think it's so clear in Scripture. There's not just a couple people who are called to make disciples. We're all called to make disciples by discipling, helping others follow Jesus. Every single one of us are to do that. But why do we struggle so much with this? Why is it such a struggle in the church? Why do we just say, well, I'll let somebody else do this? You may say, and we'll look at this in the series, it could be intimidation. You don't know enough. I'm not qualified enough. I don't know enough about the Bible. And maybe, maybe that is you. Maybe you need to be discipled. We're going to talk more about this as we get into this series. But I think the main reason why we do not make disciples and we're not seeing a, a major uh, uh, move of the Spirit into in making disciples and, and the church as a whole, I would struggle to say, um, has a culture of discipleship. It's because we are a culture that is so focused on ourselves. We are naturally self-oriented. We naturally, as sinful humans, we naturally think about ourselves first. We think about our wants. We think about our needs. Like, I mean, you just think about it, just, it's just the, the, the call to witness and, and to feed and to proclaim and to make disciples. Well, we say, well, well, you know, I, I, I'd rather have someone disciple me, or I, I'd rather have someone feed me, or I'd rather have somebody proclaim to me or witness to me. Like, it's always like, I, I want you to do this to me, and never on the other side say, Jesus' understanding is, this is your job to go do this. Like every single one of you, this is your job to go do this. Not just a couple people to feed you. No, if you are a disciple of Christ, you are to go do this. You now we all have excuses. And say, well, I don't have time. I'm too busy. And, and listen, I, I get it. But I think there are, as we're going to get into the deeper of the series, there are so many ways you can make disciples, and it does not take a lot of your time. But what it does take is us to have a major adjustment in our lives. We must move from self-oriented life to become others-oriented. That's what it takes. We have to start thinking of others before ourselves. We have to have a mind shift to say, okay, it's not about me. Church is not about me. All right? Think about this. I know when we come into a service, we say, well, I want to hear a good message from the pastor. And, and some of my messages might be terrible. But, but you think about this. You come to church. What if God wanted you to come to this church, come here on Sunday, where you didn't feel like coming, not for you to get full, but maybe he wanted you to come here to fill somebody else up, to encourage somebody, to, to just lift someone else up, to pray with somebody. Like, that's the idea with church when gathering together. It's not about me coming up here or the worship band or anything else. It's a family gathering together. It's like a big meal on Sunday. We come together, we gather. So the gathering is so important. So important. But what it takes is for us to become others-oriented, to think of others above ourselves. A couple of verses I want to put out there before we close this. Philippians 2, chapter 3, verse 4. Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then Jesus says this in John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no other than this, that someone laid down his life for his friend. In the coming weeks, like I said, we're, we're going to flush this out completely of what it means to be others-oriented. But just to bring this to close, just to think about this, in, in, in both these passages, in John, in Philippians, the example that, that John uses and Paul uses as the example of of the one that lives a selfless life was Christ. He was the one that showed the greatest act of love. He's the one that, that, that lived literally a totally selfless life. Where if you follow in Philippians, it said he, he uh, emptied himself to take on the form of a human, to literally die by his own creation, to save all of us 
to take on the sin, all of our sin upon himself, all the punishment that we deserve, all the wrath that we deserve from God, he took upon himself on the cross to conquer sin and conquer death by raising from the grave. And all of us can have forgiveness through his work, not our work. This is a total selfless life. So total life is, is abandoned to others. Now, if you just want to think about this for a minute, as we come to a close, Jesus is the ultimate example of love, right? He lived an other-oriented life. You can see it so clearly as you go throughout the Gospels. But if you think about this, most of us would never have the chance to show the ultimate form of love like Jesus did in laying down his life. Most of us will never, ever lay down our life for somebody. Maybe some of you might, maybe some of you have, maybe even. But most of us are not going to have that chance to, uh, you know, trains coming by. You push the guy out of the, the train tracks and you get hit by the train. Like, most of us are not going to have that chance to save someone's life, to sacrifice our life to somebody else. But, but, we can lay down our time. We can lay down our schedule. We can lay down our selfishness for others. And our desire must be, this is the thing about this, is our desire must be when someone comes into this church, they experience a culture shock. They can experience a, a shock, a culture shock, that, that when they come into this place, they, they experience a group of people that live in a way that is so radically different than the world. They would experience a love and acceptance and a deep friendship that is out of this world, and they think, what is up with this place? What is up with these people? These people, they, they are showing the greatest act of love. They are, they are living a life that is so focused on others. What is up? And this is the start. This is the start, church, of a culture of discipleship. The start is we must live others-oriented and stop thinking about ourselves always. <coughs> In the next few weeks, we're going to look into deeper, like I said, more practical ways of how to do this. Right? Some, I know some of your minds are already moving there. Well, how? How do I do this, right? How do I make disciples? We're going to look into this deeper, looking into God's Word of how Jesus did this, how uh, the disciples did this, and I think we'll get a clear understanding of how. But it's going to take every single one of you starting to live a selfless life. And what I would ask if you want to come to closing as we uh, pray or we're going to do a baptism is I would ask every single one of you to, to look at your life and repent of the selfishness that you have. And I, I, I'm bold to say every single one of you, including myself, we all have selfishness in our life. Every single one of us does. Unless you're Jesus, you, have, you are selfish in some way. Every single one of us have it. And what we need to do is look at our life and say, okay, well, how am I focusing on myself too much? How, how can I focus on others more? That's the start of discipling people. It's focusing on others. So what I'm going to ask is, is this week, honestly look at your life, humble yourself, knock out the pride, and really realize where you are being selfish in your life and start living focused on others. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, um, do a work in us, God. All of us, we have this selfishness. All of us have this this thing in us, this, this sin that just causes us to just focus on ourselves. It causes us to just think about us always. And Lord, I would pray that you would just just call that out in every single one of our lives. The, one of the Holy Spirit's work is to, is to help us bear fruit. You said the Father will prune us. You said the Father will cut things out of our life. Lord, I pray you would cut the selfishness out of our life. You would cut the selfishness out of this church. It's, it's here. It's in my life. It's in all of our lives. And it's going to keep creeping up. It's never going to go away. It's part of our sinful nature. But Lord, I pray when we see it, we can call it out and say, that's not right. I know it's not right, and I know I need to focus on others. And Lord, help us to see this so clearly and help us to hate it and want it out of our life. Lord, this is the start to seeing a culture of discipleship. It's a start what disciples had to do. They had to deny themselves and follow Christ. Help us to deny ourselves, help us to deny the world and deny all our desires and start to live a life fully devoted to you, following you, being your disciple. And part of that is discipling others. Lord, as I pray right now, if there's anybody in this room that, that is not a disciple of you, 
that does not know you, even has listening online, that does not know you, I pray right now that you would convict them in some way. Through your Holy Spirit, you would just help them to see the need for you. To help them understand your love that you have for them. And right now, I pray that they would make you their king. They're surrendering their life over to you. And they would start a new life with you. Something we're going to see happen in just a, a few moments in the life of Dia. Thank you for what you're doing. Help us to live this out this week and make disciples. And just, just provide opportunities for us this week as we go out. We love you. We just pray. Amen. All right. So, let's tell you, you got baptism. It's Diaz. I don't know where he is. He's right there. Okay. Um, all right. So, come on, Diaz. I get his testimony. I won't go into the phone, Diaz. All right, so I share a little story. I met Diaz. I got to share this last week, how I met him, but um, some of you guys that weren't here didn't hear. Uh, it was the first service. I think at the you can help it. Um, put your head in the story. Is it right there? Yeah. Is it? Will. Will filled it up. Um, <laughs> spin, her, spin her around a little bit. I said it's Diaz, he's fine. His mom got baptized, he made it a little warmer, but we figured Diaz would want a like, like cold baptism. Um, <laughs> all right, so anyway, I, I met Diaz at, uh, it was the first uh, Head of Falls Park service we did. He came up, he talked to me a little bit, and then he just kind of popped up um, all, like almost every week at the food cart. We had a lot of conversations, prayed with him to receive Christ. It's one of those things when you pray with somebody, you always kind of, you always know, wonder, did they really surrender their life over to Christ? Did they really um, totally give their life over? Did they ask forgiveness of their sin? And I always question that. And uh, I even told this story, you know, but I, t- I told this story when I was sharing the food cart to a bunch of pastors. And I even said that. I don't know what's going to happen with Diaz. And I said, we'll see if God moves on him and if he gets, if he gets baptized. I said, we'll see if this is real. And there he is, getting baptized. So it's really, really awesome. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> all right. I'll read his testimony and then we'll dunk him in the water. All right, this is Diaz. This is what he wrote. He says, uh, It started a couple years ago. I started to feel alone because people were leaving. I felt that no one cared. I started to become alone and hide in my room. I was so angry every day. I would take it out on my mom and brother and sister because I would cry every night because I would never feel like I had anyone to talk to then. A year went by and people and people got on my nerves all the time. I would fight anyone I saw. Uh, I would think back to moments where my mom and where, where me and my mom got abused. I hated everyone and did not talk to no one. I thought I had to give up because I could not talk. I was scared to go outside or go to school. I always got told I would never succeed. Then, then this year, um, but this year happened, and I met John at the food cart, and we talked. I felt happy for the first time I heard that God would help me. I got happy and had faith that I would do something in my life finally. I started to pray to God, and my life had started to change, and now I feel happy, and I'm not mad a lot anymore. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Excited for you, Diaz. I can see what God's been doing in your life. All right, so, all right, so who is your Lord Savior, Diaz? Who is your Lord Savior? God. Jesus Christ. All right. <laughs> uh, I got baptized in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs>